Good morning, everyone. Hope everyone's enjoying the show so far the past couple of days. We'll just wait a couple of minutes for the rest of the people to join on and we'll get started. Just a couple minutes and we'll get going. Okay, can everybody hear me? Hopefully, okay. If if not, um, just go ahead and put in uh, in the chat. Um, anytime you have questions or answers, go ahead and use the question and answer uh, portal, or feel free to um, save to the end. Um, you can contact me through um, my booth as well. A lot of our documentation, brochures, pictures. Uh, we have some training videos on there as well, and a lot of information on there. But uh, you can always reach out to me with any other information that you need. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started here. Uh, first of all, thank you for joining us today. Um, we'll be learning a little about Indiana limestone. Hopefully all of you have uh, heard of Indiana limestone before. I'm sure you have seen it. Um, being in Ottawa, uh, we have quite a bit of Indiana limestone in the area. We will show a couple pictures of that there. Um, we're all throughout Canada, United States. Um, so really happy to be here today. Um, unfortunately, we can't have the event in person. It's always an event I like to do every year um, uh, with Merkley's uh, great event. They really promote the industry and promote um, all the, uh, the surrounding area as well. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started with the presentation. Um, if any of you are AIA members, um, we this is a certified presentation and you can get a present uh, credits for that. Um, I know Merkley will provide credits as well, but um, if you do need AIA uh, certification, um, please let me know. I'm happy to provide a specific uh, a certificate for that. So a little bit about uh, Indiana Limestone. Uh, we are now part of Polycore. Polycore is a Quebec company. Um, we now have over 50 quarries worldwide throughout North America and Europe, mainly in North America and Canada and US. Uh, we do have um, uh, a couple quarries in uh, France as well, limestone quarries. So over 20 manufacturing plants, uh, over 1,500 employees worldwide now. Uh, we have, are continually growing the business. We just acquired another company, North Carolina Granite. Um, so we do have separate divisions. Uh, Indiana Limestone has fallen under the Polycarb division. So through Polycore, we have a commercial and institutional division, residential, the hardscapes and masonry. I oversee all the hardscapes and masonry in Canada, except for the Quebec market. Um, and then we have Swinson 
Granite Works, which is out of the Eastern US and based out of Vermont. And they have several retail stores. Our Rock of Ages division is actually our Memorial and Specialty Division uh, based in Vermont and in um, Stansted, Quebec. And then we have Vertrazo, which is our residential product line, and that's a recycled product. So all of these products are mainly using natural stone only, and they're recorded in North America um, or in France there beside the Vertrazo project. Okay. So here's our quarry locations within North America. Um, you see Indiana limestone there. Uh, what we're we talking about um, primarily today, uh, but then you see locations where all the, a lot of the other granites, marbles come from. Uh, so we really have a, a color uh, product for every application. Uh, but today we'll be talking about Indiana limestone. So here's a quick video um, that will give you a quick introduction of Indiana limestone um, and what we do. For over 125 years, Indiana Limestone Company has provided the highest quality natural stone building products for unmatched and timeless architectural beauty. Our limestone is etched into the history of the American skyline. Indiana Limestone is featured in over half of the U.S. state capitol buildings and on iconic buildings such as 30 Rockefeller Plaza, the National Cathedral, and the Pentagon. Recent projects include the Royal Alberta Museum, the Civil Rights and Mississippi History Museums, and the Metropolitan Transportation Authority Building in Brooklyn. Indiana Limestone's vision and mission has evolved from a courier to a... Oops. Sorry, we had a little difficulty there to a vertically integrated high-end building products company. Our two signature product lines are Urban Hardscapes and Estate Veneer Series. Our veneers, Vanderbilt Classic, Berkshire, and Rockford Estate Blend offer timeless accents and durability to residential, institutional, and commercial projects. Our Urban Hardscape products, which include pavers, wall caps, pier caps, cool coping, garden wall and steppers, offer an expansive product line for dealers. The strength of the Indiana Limestone Company is consistently providing reliable and innovative building solutions. Investments in technology have allowed us to continually be the largest limestone quarrier in the United States, with over 4,500 acres and more than 300 years of the highest quality stone reserves. This year, we look to expand our active quarry footprint by opening four new mining areas. This expansion will allow us to better serve our customers and projects. Today, balances in new technology advancements and quarrying techniques with our wire saw extraction, block drills, and ground penetrating radar have resulted in a more environmentally friendly process. We're working to align our operations to conform with the Natural Stone Council's sustainability standard. This will grant lead points to builders and help enable our building products to fit in the 2030 challenge. Indiana Limestone Company is a solutions provider for architects and help to bring their vision to life. Our design assist approach creates a collaborative environment for design and construction teams to make improvements in design efficiency, cost management, speed to market, and constructability. Our investment in a new Italian state-of-the-art polishing line will enable us to provide more versatility and design options for our customers. To that end, we have entered the stone panel cladding market with a proprietary system of lightweight limestone panels. We are one of the few companies with the capability to provide short lead time by moving from the quarries to a finished panel. We have the team, the flexibility, the products, and the proven track record to make your vision a reality. We are the Indiana Limestone Company. talks about a little bit about our company, um, what we've done in the past, um, it gives you a little overview, shows you some of the quarries. So what I'd like to do now is uh, we'll go through quite a bit of pictures just to show you that the breadth of Indiana limestone, and then we'll get to the meat and potatoes of everything with some technical information uh, um, that really is the majority of it. But really want to show you um, the different opportunities with Indiana limestone first. Uh, we, we've also often called, you know, it's a very classical stone, but it's very modern, so it's, all, it's timeless. So through these, some of these pictures, you'll see the different things we've done from commercial, hardscapes to uh, residential. Really, we have an application for everything uh, from standard product to all, all the way through to custom. So this is the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. Um, you can see here 
um, very ornate carvings and details. What's interesting about this project was that it took 82 years to complete from the beginning to the end of the project. Every single courier of Indiana limestone participated in this project. So it also shows you the consistency along the deposit. So um, as a designer, architect, or, or a builder, it's important to know that on these projects where, you know, say some another quarry has issues getting material, um, if that's the case, or say if there's a, a, a something like COVID where businesses uh, falter or fail, there's always someone that can step in and help provide, provide that material. So very, very uh, proud of this product. This is well over 100 years old now, um, and it took 82 years to build in every single manufacturer, every single four of Indiana Limestone participated in. You can see in the details, um, very, very popular for carving, um, very ornate. Um, one of the things we often say with Indiana Limestone is whatever you can do with wood, you can do with Indiana Limestone. Well, just, just different applications. This is Central Park West in New York. Um, they wanted the, this is where Alex Rodriguez, Madonna have location, the product, uh, penthouses, um, all the very high end uh, clientele here. They wanted natural stone. And when they came to us at Indiana Limestone, we provided our full color blend material at a, a better price than they could have even expected. And but really one of those things that, you know, the high end clientele wanted natural stone and they want to Indiana Limestone for this project specifically. On the left, we have a standard size product with brick. Uh, that's U Condos in London, Ontario. Uh, Universe, or, um, Athletes Village, Olympic Village in uh, on the right, that is in uh, Vancouver, BC, all of the, the housing for the athletes that are there now, condos, were all done with Indian limestone, full color blend, and standard size panel. Royal Alberta Museum was a, a recent project we did a couple years ago. This is the Indiana Gray. What's interesting about this project was originally it was specified as cast material. We were able to come in at larger panel sizes and underneath the original uh, cost of concrete material. So the misconception that natural stone will always be more expensive than man-made materials is not true. Um, this did help them get the lead certification as well, but we were able to do larger panels and with a better cost than with man-made materials. So um, the misconception that cost is always gonna be an issue um, is not true, but you also wanna look at the life cycle cost of the building. Often when you're using a natural stone, the life cycle um, cost is much, much lower than using man-made products. Washington, D.C., just again, different design features with glass, which is a lot of how, uh, condos with glazing. Obviously, um, you see in the downtown cores, um, Indian limestone goes with really any other color. This is University of Michigan, brick in Indian limestone, very, very common. Indian limestone gets used a lot for the windowsills, trim, and accent features because it's a neutral color and it really works with every single other color. So it's very, very common to use. Um, very long pieces are available as well, which is not very common in, in most natural stone. Fairmount, uh, Fairmont Hotel in McDonald um, is similar to the Chateau Laurier, which we'll see next um, uh, on your right here. That is full color blend, um, Indiana limestone, some of our, our trademark ones. Then across the street is the government conference center there in, in the Indiana buff. So very proud of these uh, heritage projects. Um, one of the interesting, like the Fairmont, uh, uh, the Royal York, the Hotel McDonald, and um, the Fort Geary Hotel in Winnipeg. These are all Grand Turk Railroad hotels that were done um, at the turn of the century. Um, and they were all chosen with Indiana limestone and all well over 100 years old and doing very, very well. Yankee Stadiums. Uh, so you'll see this project. We'll talk about this one again later. This shows our full color blend. Um, unfortunately, it's not on the Blue Jays, but uh, hopefully when they redo it, we will see some Indiana limestone on there. Again, different application. This is our split face coursing, very, very popular in the residential market, uh, very, very cost effective as well, and available in full and thin veneers. And this is Eau Claire Tower in uh, Calgary. Uh, large, large pieces, five foot by five foot pieces in our silver buff. Uh, you can see the different colors. Um, uh, with use with a black man-made product with a glazing, uh, very, very modern looking uh, building there. We see mostly on the exteriors, but now we're seeing more and more natural stone going in the interior. This is Northwestern University. On the right, you can see all the Indiana gray material there that was custom fabricated, but we're seeing more and more natural stone going into the uh, inside as well, bringing nature into the, uh, into the living quarters. Split-faced material. 
This is a home and residence in uh, British Columbia. Uh, they're utilizing thin veneer and full bed on this on this project in the interior. Really seamlessly goes to the exterior. Staircases, custom panels for special profile for accents. House in deep, uh, house in Colorado. So residential markets are very, very big market for us, especially one of our larger markets. Uh, we're well known for large, large commercial buildings, but majority of the stone we do sell is into the residential market, especially in Ontario. Um, one of the hottest markets for us is Ontario with Indiana limestone, with the veneers and the window sills specifically. This is a tumble product in Mississauga, Ontario. This is custom material done in Oakville, Ontario. Another project in Mississauga using split face material. Project out in Edmonton using a thin veneer, different design. This is our full color blend material. Um, I like showing this picture just because you can see what full color blend is. Majority of the projects in Ottawa are utilizing full color blend material. Any of the historic projects primarily would have been full color blend as well. Um, you can clearly see that you've got some stones with multiple, with the, both the buff and gray color in there. Whenever we quarry uh, Indian limestone, and we'll talk about this some more, um, that full color blend or variegated material is always every in every quarry, in every location. So we have more abundance of it. So the better price point, I prefer it because you know the stone is it, natural. Uh, Man-made manufacturers spend millions of dollars trying to replicate this look, uh, but it can't be done just like nature. So it's a great product, um, great look, um, and my preferred one, so you know it's natural stone. Using accent to landscape, here we have a uh, lips carved in the seating wall, uh, the, the actual wall cap with skate stops are, that are created with it are all done, and it all ties back into the, the building here as well, um, all done with Indiana limestone. Brick, brick and stone work hand in hand together. Uh, we'll talk about window sills a little bit more, but uh, window sills is a primary product of ours. It's something that really any house or project should have on there, especially uh, help uh, combat um, mortar breakage as far as using smaller pieces that main, by main, main manufacturers. Again, exterior houses moving in. This is the same house in DC. Landscape is a, a very large market. So we've um, launched a hardscape division um, recently with a lot of our granites and marble as well as standard product. You can see that for sure in our booth there. Um, but right now we're just talking about Indiana limestone. Here you see our full color blend. Salt water pools do not affect the stone. Um, we have seen certain instances, very few, where a homeowner was using water from the actual salt water pool to hose off the pavers. And there was some rust staining um, that was easily remedied by just power washing it. And then once they started using hose water to clean the pavers or hose them off, that went away. So um, not a problem with salt water pools. Three saws, not a problem as well. We'll talk about that more. Um, but very, very common. Um, we use more and more every year with uh, pools and pavers. Uh, very high solar reflectivity with Indiana limestone. So on a hot summer day, you can walk on the stone and not burn your feet. Um, that also can help uh, add to lead credits for solar reflectivity as well as another uh, highlight for that. More hardscape stuff. Carvings. Uh, we're lucky with our stone as we call it what a free stone. So what that means is it can be uh, cut in any direction without no without a weak cleavage cutting. So that means a lot of stones have bed layers that you can only cut in certain directions uh, to hold the structural integrity of it. With Indiana limestone, that's not the case. Uh, carvers prefer our material, very easy to work with, but still very durable. On the left, you have these hands um, that are outside the Indianapolis airport. You've got what I call the Lego feature on top um, being uh, in between the process being built. And that's done in Indiana. And then on the bottom right, um, you've got actually a, a, from an auto, uh, one of your own auto ones is from Smith and Barber, Danny Barber and uh, Phil Smith. They created this project for the uh, Canada 150 in Thorold. So it, uh, it, it's designed to uh, look like a, 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 a row house, or I'm sorry, a, a, a boat house. And so that's in Thorold and that's a Canada 150 project. Originally, they wanted to try to use um, Queenston limestone. They didn't have the availability of material or um, in, in blocks as large as they needed. So they came to us and we were able to get them blocks within a week. Uh, that method 
parameters, and then it was out um, sent out to Ottawa and finished on site by the team at Smith and Barber. You can't talk about Indiana without the Indianapolis 500. Um, here's a life-size replica of an Indianapolis 500 Speedway car. Um, very impressive. Uh, this is outside of the Indianapolis uh, Motor Speedway Museum on the grounds now. In person, if you look on the underside of the bolts on the engine, you can even see the threads they put in into the bolts. So the detail that can be done with Indian limestone is very, very highly done. Um, but still very, very durable. That body of the car is one single piece of Indiana limestone um, that's been carved out of a block. So very, very uh, uh, great product used for highly detailed pieces for carvings as well. So now we're gonna get into the, the meat and potatoes, as we say, um, of what Indiana limestone is and who we are. Um, Indiana Limestone Company has been around since the early, uh, the, early 1926 and actually had its start in the late 1800s um, with local porters, but we, not until 1926 when they were conglomerated and became one company. So we have over 5,000 acres currently um, of quarry land, the largest reserve in the industry for Indian limestone. Um, to put that in perspective, the next largest quarry would probably have um, 40 to 50 employees, while well, we're over 300 employees uh, now in the height of the season. Um, we sell in three main categories, the raw blocks, um, raw slabs, which are just blocks cut to a certain thickness, and then our standard products. Um, we have eight quarries. A couple of these quarries are, are recent acquisitions or uh, open, newly opened quarries. Um, we will talk about that a little bit more, um, but right now we just really want to go over what we're gonna see in the rest of this presentation. So we'll talk about the history of Indiana limestone. We'll talk about the quarry operations. How do we extract that material? New technologies that are being used for Indi um, to extract that material. The specifics of Indiana limestone. Um, some differences between Indian limestone and cast uh, stone, as that is our major competitor. Um, Cost-effective de design options, and then uh, we'll finish it with why Indiana limestone. So what Indiana limestone is? Um, what is Indiana limestone? It is a, a lytic stone, um, so it's a type two stone. Um, it, it was created 330 million years ago. How I like to explain it is uh, the most easy, easiest is um, we've all seen pictures or if we've been lucky, we've been to the Florida Keys. Um, that's got a small shell fragments and a sandy beach. It was not really sand, it's actually small shell fragments um, of uh, or marine organisms over time. So. That white sandy beaches in the area is exactly what was done. Um, what was the same in Indiana area uh, 330 million years ago? So this area, what we call as the Stone Belt, that where that tropical sea was back 330 million years ago. This gray area here um, is that trop shallow tropical sea where those deposits were left of the small shell fragments that over time and pressure created Indiana limestone. For it to be considered Indiana limestone, it has to come from this area, from these three counties in Indiana. Anywhere else in the world is not an exact a replica, uh, but it has to come from this area to be called Indiana limestone. You'll see towards the center, Olytic, Indiana. That is actually where our empire quarry is. And the Olytic name comes from the Ulites, um, which, are the sh what the shell, uh, which are the shell fragments. Um, and that's the organism, and that's where the Indian limestone got its name. So the early history of Indian limestone, the quarries first started in the early 1800s. Um, Indian limestone, as mentioned, um, started in the 1920s. The company itself uh, originally were just used for local materials. Uh, a lot of it was used for bridge abutments for railroad tracks um, with large blocks. And as the railroads expanded, we started to see the expansion of the stone throughout North America as well. Uh, really in the 1870s when you have the fires in Chicago and Boston, um, and we also have some similar ones in Toronto, um, they, they noticed that obviously wood buildings um, uh, burned in the structures, that brick and masonry structures were withheld um, the, the fires the best, uh, and that Indian limestone was one of the preferred um, materials that really worked the best with those fires and were the most durable. So those, that material um, is one of the reasons while Indian limestone really started to boom. So with the railroads expanding, we started to uh, see more and more stone be uh, moved throughout North America. And we started seeing it in Canada a lot more at that time point as well, um, with those uh, 
Grand Trunk Railroad uh, hotels. Um, those are all things that really help uh, expand that Indiana line from throughout North America. Um, and then as that expanded, the quarries in the, the fabricators doubled um, every, almost every 20 years they were doubling in size. So on the right, you see one of our open pit quarries, um, and that's primarily how Indiana limestone is quarried, is using an open pit. Um, with uh, about until um, five years ago, there's um, been primarily only in open pit Indiana limestone quarries. On the left, you'll see a couple of mine, uh, open underground mines. The top one is our Elliott quarry. We acquired Elliott um, limestone about uh, two years ago, or a year and a half ago. And Elliott's is an Indiana limestone courier. Um, they've invented a lot of technology and machinery to do uh, underground mining with Indiana limestone. When we acquired them, we also had them um, use their technology to open a new um, underground mine as well. And that's below on the left. That is our Victor mine. And so this is uh, what you see is a, a section of uh, basically uh, our Victor quarry. At the top, there's a, a, a Counting road that we you know were looking at moving at one period of time, but due to the cost, we never did. Um, and we know there's a lot of great material underneath that road. So with uh, we quarried right up to the end of that road, and so we basically had a cliff. And then with the acquisition of Elliot, um, we were able to use their technology and their know-how to go straight into the side of that uh, that mine. Why that is important for us? These underground mines is one. It's added approximately two to 300 years of reserves. Um, so with that, we have approximately 500 years of reserves now, um, company-wide, uh, uh, tested core uh, known materials. Another thing is the ground on top, on top does not need to be stirred. So uh, above the Elliott Quarry, there is farmland and people have no idea below that there's active pouring going on. Um, and the other op opportunity with this is we allow a allowed to quarry year round. Uh, Indiana has got similar weather to the Toronto area. Uh, so they do get snow every year. We typically on open pit mines, we have to stop pouring uh, around October. At the earliest, we have to stop then. Um, if we're lucky, we're lucky, we can go into late November and, and some years even in, in the beginning of December. And then we usually shut down until March. So with these two mines, we've been able to, uh, with this year, we've been able to to open the Victor mine and we've been able to have a better position of having stone coming throughout the winter and starting a spring than we've ever had before. So we'll continue to use both those technologies uh, to, to continue to quarry underground and uh, above ground as well. So here's a selection view of one of our quarries. Um, so you see that uh, broken or a um, burden layer, what we call on top. So it's also, it's mainly called St. Louis limestone. Um, it's been for, before called bastard stone as well. And the reason is this stone is not dimensionally strong. Uh, it cannot be used for structural elements. It's really used for Department of Transportation um, material. It, it's very weak and it's usually blasted off. Um, most of the time now we actually just push that material into an open pit as we reclaim the quarry. Um, because most of it can't be used and even new, using it for a DOT aggregate, it, it costs more money to use and to quarry and to transport than actually it's worth. So we just reclaim it back into the ground. Um, so it, it is an inert product, so it, it doesn't hurt going back straight back in the ground without having to do anything. We typically will have four to five benches, um, and those are basically the layers we call, uh, layers of how we quarry. Uh, bench one, two, three, are typically above the water table um, and where, or where water is holding. Um, we usually see bench five is difficult uh, because so much water is used in the coring process, um, rainy seasons and stuff like that. So bench five is very difficult. Sometimes we do not go after bench five either. You'll hear the word Salem limestone, also Bedford limestone from time to time. Bedford is one of the counties that Indian limestone is found in. Salem limestone and Bedford limestone or old terminology for Indian limestone. So they are the exact same thing. So from time to time, you may see a speck of Bedford limestone or Salem limestone, which is even older. Those are all synonymous with um, Indiana limestone. So our quarry sauce, uh, how do we quarry this material? So on the left, you'll see a, a large, basically overgrown chainsaw. Uh, this is um, pretty simple. What we do, we have a railroad track system which you can see uh, on the right, so this track that's leveled out. 
and you've got four saws there and those saws basically go into the ground and, and cut the material and you can see the saw lines there. They're typically 16 feet long um, and that will provide uh, uh, a 14 foot block out of that uh, cut there. And we do have different sides, but on average those blades are 16 feet long and we'll end up cutting the whole floor, um, that whole area first and then go to the removal of the blocks. We are looking at uh, new technology, uh, using different material, different apparatuses for our, some of our machinery where we can actually go on one block at a time instead of cutting the whole floor, uh, looking at using underwire and saw and different drilling rigs to be able to pull one block at a time so we're able to have continuous productivity instead of having to wait as we turn blocks over on the whole floor. So how we extract that block once we cut it is we take these large rubber pillows, rubber um, basically airbags, and we slide them down into the, the saw cut and we turn on uh, air compressors and those pillows blow up and push that block over. Um, very low technology, um, very effective. Um, this is very common in a lot of uh, pouring operations. We use these rubber pillows because they have the strength um, to do what, we, do what we need. They are reusable as well. And this block um, on average can be up to half a million pounds. Um, so very, very large blocks. And then we go to the separation period afterwards. Um, if we could ship this, you could get material this big, but we're really limited as far as trucking right now, um, as far as you know, what we can ship on a, on a truck to go in there. But these pieces will come in one single piece when we you know, cut them sometime. So after we, we turn that block over, what we're looking to do is we're looking at grading the material, trying to split the blocks into smaller blocks that are more usable. On average, we are looking for uh, four foot six height and eight foot long length and two to three feet depth in the block. Um, that's preferred um, by the fabricators and what we, we utilize our material and our production lines for. So those are what we try to um, make out of the blocks but depending on where seams are located um, fracture points uh, we will split off into smaller sections um, you'll see on the left new technologies are being used this is our drilling rig and this is pressure sensitive drilling rig which was done by jackhammers before um, is now done by an automated machine with one with one worker uh, much quicker uh, much easier on the, the worker as well uh, these guys are out in the middle of the quarries in the rain sometimes and hot sun and uh, it's a very you know, labor intensive job still uh, but we're working to improve always the safety and the, um, the the amount of stone we can recover from the material so on the bottom left there's our splitting rig uh, these hydraulic splitters are put into the holes that are drilled by the drilling rig and then manually um, the pins come down and create a fracture point on the block on the uh, loader there, you can see those uh, um, that rig, or see the drill holes from where that splitter created that fracture point. So we're working on every year to get create square blocks. And the reason we wanna work on getting square blocks is because we're able to get more on the truck, less waste to use for fabricators, and, and all of that helps to get the cost down on the material. Um, after those blocks are split, they're laid out and then they're graded. And we'll talk about grading shortly. Uh, about the different colors, um, the different grades within that color. Um, and then when we're working with fabricators, we have different grades as far as seams um, that lower the price as well, the blocks and material. Um, here you can see our gray material, um, but we're really always looking to get square and square blocks as possible. Can't talk about um, our Empire Quarry without um, talking about blocks. So um, here you see uh, our picture of our Empire Quarry at the Lytic plant. And that is named after the Empire State Building, of course. And this is where all the stone come, has, came from, the Empire State Building came from this, this part of our quarry. Um, it's not being in operation, this, that actual section anymore, uh, but it is something that we've left open uh, partially so people can come see when they do these quarry tours where the Empire State Building did come from. So you've got a picture of what they were doing before. A um, lot of uh, environmental issues with the, the, the smoke being used in the machinery diesel applications um, we're using more and more green machinery every year but um, this material uh, it all came from empire state building came from this quarry at the empire so if you're ever able to come to our quarry tours this will be a, a one of the highlights and a, a great picture point as well 
So now we'll talk about the colors of Indiana limestone. We have three basic colors, um, buff, gray, and full color blend. Um, buff is the premier color. Uh, it is higher up in the quarry and it is basically just has less organic material. Gray is lower in the quarry. It has more organic material and it's mainly saturated with water. Um, so gray will lighten, um, but this is a usually light color. It's very close to what we would call a concrete color. Um, typically gray does get lighter. Um, full color blend comes everywhere in the quarry. So you can see this piece here has a section of both buff and gray within it. It's not going to always be perfect like that. So you may have a stone that has all buff. They have some with all gray. They have a, a, a variance of both. Um, that is the, really the difference between these colors. Um, sometimes you may hear the word variegated uh, be used for the uh, full color blend. That is not a really correct terminology. Variegated means all colors and all grades. And depending on what product you're talking about, if you're talking about an Indiana Limestone um, Company product panel or, or Vanderbilt series, and you're asking for full color blend, it would only come in standard grade. So it would not include rustic material. Um, so that would only be standard grade. So it would not, variegated is not a correct terminology. Uh, but it often, often gets used for full color blend material. In terms of our grade, we have select, standard, and rustic. Select is primarily used only for high-end carvings. And even at that point, um, um, it's standards still primarily used. Select grade looks like the, the grain texture looks almost like a sugar cube. So very, very fine grain material. Um, it is very expensive compared to the other materials and will only be sold for carving applications if available. We only get a few blocks of that a year. Standard grade is primarily what is always used. Um, and then you have a rustic grade and as you can see it's a, a medium to large uh, 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 grain size from larger shell fragmentation in that stone, um, a more rustic looking stone, but a better price point as well. Um, very common um, to see um, it used for a split face material. Uh, you will not see large fossils in Indiana limestone. Um, it does happen very rarely, um, but it's nothing that would come out where you're not going to see a large uh, fish fossil or anything like that. Where you see many, maybe some other stones you would. That doesn't really, it's not really seen in any limestone product. <clears throat> now we talk a little bit more about putting the stone on the walls. Um, anchor selection, uh, how do we use the material? Um, always hot dip galvanized at, a, at, a, at least a minimum. Um, different galvanized companies or products and they're from different locations and, and can have different performance. Um, no matter what product you use, a stone, man-made product, if that anchor rusts, you're going to have a failure with the actual material on top. So you'll have sea spalling or anything like that. So stainless steel is always recommended, um, but at the very minimum, hot dip galvanized. Um, if it's not, you're going to see rusting um, happening and you can most likely see a failure of the stone or whatever product you use on that, on that project. So here are some examples of anchor, uh, anchor selection. Um, for most residential applications, standard brick ties are used. Um, we're starting to see um, the stone facades actually getting farther and farther from the, the building uh, structure due to installation requirements. The anchor manufacturers are, are bringing out new anchors for that. Um, when you're utilizing, uh, say, something like a two inch thick panel, uh, we'd like to see a a penetrating anchor, like a pin or a kerf type of anchor, um, but when you're using full bed, uh, standard brick ties are most commonly used. One of the reasons I, I show Yankee Stadium again um, is when we're talking about applications uh, of use is this is done on precast panels. Um, all the Yankee Stadium project was done with precast panels that were actually done in Toronto um, and then shipped down back down to New York. So the Stone originated in Indiana, was fabricated, went up to uh, basically up to Toronto, um, put on the panel, and then brought back down and as a giant jigsaw puzzle. So how they do this is they put the stone facing down in a mold uh, or a form there, and so you can see that stone down is down in underneath that rebar and anchors. Um, they'll anchor the stone, uh, put rebar in there, and then they'll backfill that material and create large, uh, basically. Like I, like I say, puzzle pieces that can be lifted on site uh, quite quickly. So on a downtown floor, a large commercial project, these are very efficient, um, installed very quickly. Um, you don't have to have um, a lay down area on site that's large. The trucks basically come in, they lift them off, 
and go straight on onto the application um, where they need to go. Growing every year, we're starting to see more and more thin veneer. Uh, so we do have thin veneer in our uh, smooth, uh, thin, uh, smooth thin panels in uh, split face material in a tumble material. Thin veneer is growing very popular um, throughout North America. Um, it's really starting to grow uh, very quickly out west, um, but it's also starting to grow here in, in the uh, Ontario marketplace uh, in exterior and interior. So very popular in interior. When you're using it for an exterior application, um, code is uh, dependent uh, on certain things that you need to have. It, code, the code is not written very well. It, in Ontario, where it really says that you need to have some type of drainage. It doesn't say exactly what the drainage needs to be, um, but then you need to have a, a drainage area. So there are manufacturers that make drainage mats um, out there um, with vent holes. Um, what you're trying to do is make sure that water drains out um, when the stone moisture gets absorbed by the stone and gets to the mortar, that it drains down and out and doesn't get like, into the building envelope. Uh, when you're doing it on the interior, you don't need that drainage application. So you can basically go like your uh, to uh, your actual cement bore with your scratch coat and apply it to that directly to that scratch coat after 24 hours with this mortar. One of the things I would like to bring out when we're talking about um, mortars is um, the common um, the need for what we call uh, low alkaline mortars. So Indian limestone is a light color stone. Um, it also is an absorptive stone. So as it absorbs moisture. If that mortar has high alkaline content, you can't see rust staining on there. I'll show you some pictures of those shortly, but rust staining is coming from the alkaline content of actual mortar. So what we like to see is low alkaline mortars be used with um, Indian limestone for pointing or anything like that. But also um, uh, white is primarily preferred because white typically has less alkaline um, in the mortar. So a low alkaline mortar uh, preferably white, um, which actually works with the color um, of Indian limestone um, better anyways. And then if you need to, you can tint the material at that point to uh, whatever you need for the mortar. But always want to use a low alkaline or non low alkaline non-stating mortar with Indian limestone. Maintenance and cleaning. Um, one of the most common questions I, I get with Indian limestone is what can we use for sealer? Uh, the Indian Limestone Institute in the Indian Limestone Company um, rec do not recommend any sealers be used. Um, they can be used. If they are going to be used, we recommend that it be a, a breathable um, sealer um, and non-staining or color changing. So the main thing is it needs to be breathable. Uh, so the, the stone is free to um, breathe moisture in and out. So as it absorbs moisture, that is allowed it to come out. Otherwise, you can trap moisture into the stone and have problems. With anything, um, any kind of uh, third party product, it should always be tested on the stone prior to. Um, I can give some recommended uh, sealers that have been used uh, well, but even when you've tested sealers, uh, manufacturers do change the sealer uh, composition from time to time. So it is always recommended that you test. But overall, Indian limestone is not needed, does not need to have a sealer on the product. Sealers are maintenance items, so something that you have to reapply uh, over a certain period of time based on the manufacturer's recommendation. Um, on a horizontal application, you can see like this, um, this is outside of our uh, Empire quarry and plant. We have about 30 trucks, semi trucks driving by a day here, lots of dust, rain, uh, all sorts of different things. Over time, the stone's gotten dirty. Um, and that's environmental fallout. Um, that's not allergy on the stone here, that's environmental fallout. And the easiest way to clean Indian limestone is 1200 PSI, 12 inches away with a fan tip nozzle on a power washer. This is the same cheap power washer you can buy at Home Depot, Rona, any of these locations. Um, as you can see here in this picture, Tony's one of our sales reps and he's doing a quick pass with the, um, the power washer and it really transformed that stone, how it looks. And this is mainly on the horizontal surface for wall caps. You're gonna see environmental from environmental pollution. Um, this is gonna happen and this can happen with any other product too, but easily cleaned up with Indian limestone. If you've got stubborn stains um, on, on the stone, uh, another thing that can be used is a mild detergent, like a laundry detergent. And then you can just use a nylon brush, scrub it with that uh, diluted mixture of the uh, laundry detergent, um, and then hose it off very, very well with clean water. So potable, clean potable water works great. Um, if you do have algae growth, you can use a diluted bleach uh, mixture as well, and then clean water again. 
the main thing is always clean water. Um, sun and rain um, will and will actually help clean the material, but environmental pollution um, is what we're seeing here, and it's really just on the surface of the material. So I talked about alkaline staining here. Um, it's also um, very common to see this at, at grade material. There is a misconception that Indian limestone cannot be used at grade. Um, there have been times when improper installation has led to failures with the stone or staining. The most common um, uh, comment is that the stone stains when it's used at grade. And that's because it's absorbing moisture. It is an absorptive stone, so the absorption rate of 4%. Um, so it's going to absorb moisture from below. So to counteract that, we recommend damp proofing be used on anything at or below grade. So damp proofing is a cementitious um, paste that's applied as a, a moisture barrier behind um, on the bottom side of the stone or any uh, unexposed sides. So creating, creating that moisture barrier there, that stone can't absorb moisture from below. The problem when it, uh, the stone absorbs moisture from below is it's also absorbing any contaminants, mainly salt. So as it absorbs the moisture, it's absorbing those contaminants and the salts. That moisture travels through, up through the stone and the moisture um, is expelled as it evaporates. But those salts and contaminants stay in the stone and will be on the surface. So you can see in this corner section, it's been cleaned afterwards with a pressure washer and it can easily be cleaned. But the problem is that continually can happen, um, that staining will continue unless the, the, that contaminants below the stone um, are dissipated. So if those contaminants are still there, that can still happen. Uh, if you're using a concrete slab and the, the slab is not cured, those alkalines and salts can come through that material of that the Indian limestone uh, very quickly and have the staining. So if you're using concrete slab and don't want to do the damp proofing, you can always seal the concrete as well after that concrete has been cured. Uh, but we often see concrete slabs be put down and the stone put on too quickly before the concrete can has cured and really start to see some of the staining effect happen. This would also be the same instance if you're doing it on the building and you're going straight to grade. Um, if you're up grade, then it's not an issue, but if you're going straight to grade or below grade, that first course height, you'll want to do the back and the sides of the unexposed sides for stone, and that will create a moisture barrier. You don't have to go beyond the first course height, just the first course height, if you're going all the way down to grade. So just some differences between Indiana limestone um, and cast stone. Um, on the left, obviously, you can see Indiana limestone. On the cast, you can see cast stone. Um, pretty clear on, on this type of cast material. What, what we have here is you've got different aggregates, different material um, through the stone, um, which is you know through the concrete. Um, that industry has done a remarkable job of marketing um, their materials as stone, but they are not stone. Um, stone is uh, made by Mother Nature only. Um, cast material is a, a type of concrete uh, material. So when you cut into it, depending on what you're using, you might have different aggregates. You've got void spaces. You've got different expansion and contraction, um, which can actually cause issues. Um, you you know can't cut on site typically and, and not have exact finish on the side with Indian limestone. It's the same thing through and through. So if you need to cut down on site, you've got exactly the same thing here. It's easily repairable as well. If you need to do Dutchman, you can do that with Indian limestone. That's another thing. So uh, here are some items that are different. Um, there are several different cast products that are available. There's uh, dry tamp, machine casting, wet casting. Um, there's benefits um, to each one of those for the, the cast side of the industry and why you choose one over the other. Uh, one of the things you can do with Indian, uh, with cast material that you can't do with Indian limestone is you can reinforce. You can always put more rebar into a concrete product, but you cannot do that with uh, Indian limestone. Indian limestone can be self-supporting, uh, depending on the application. Um, very easy to dress in the field. And most masons will actually do some field dressing, depending on, uh, on the product as well, to create their own uh, look stamp on the product. Uh, cleaning of uh, the Indian limestone, as I mentioned before, pressure wash, maybe a mild detergent. Um, that's really it. Um, with concrete materials using caustic materials, acids, different things um, that can really damage um, the environment and other materials. You're basically burning material off. So with Indian limestone, one thing, um, if you're doing a brick wash and there's Indian limestone on the bottom, make sure you're protecting that material. Brick washes, some of these acid cleans, if you're doing something above Indian limestone, can really burn the stone. So you don't want to do that. Um, 
As far as uh, green building materials, there is really nothing better as far as green mat building material than stone. Um, it comes from Mother Nature. It's quarried, cut, and finished. We use machinery, uh, we use water, or we power, um, no uh, additional trucking of different aggregates to create the material. They all come from one area. Uh, so the greenest material available is, um, is natural stone and it's one of the things that's been around uh, for hundreds of years. And you look at uh, the Romans, the, uh, the pyramids, you know, stuff that lasts for forever. Um, it's an inert material. So you can, when you're tearing the buildings apart, you can go back into the ground or you can reuse that material as well. So here's some test data kind of comparison. So uh, Indian limestone is a uh, 4,000 PSI. Um, the max absorption rate is seven and a half percent, but we um, tested four to five percent. One thing that is interesting with Indian limestone, um, it's called a hardened stone. So it actually will get harder over time as, as it weathers. Um, on restoration projects that sort of then has stone on, um, for over a hundred years, they've actually tested some of the stone and actually like the opposite. The internal structure of the weathered stone was actually stronger and actually became stronger and harder over time. Um, so very interesting there. Free saw, uh, we primarily have gone off historical data. Um, we do have free saw testing on Indian limestone. Uh, now and it passes, uh, not a problem. We have it in uh, Indian limestone so throughout Canada, so we know it works in our environment. Uh, we have quite a bit in Alberta where we have lots of free thaw. Uh, we even have a project in Quebec where we're used as a thin, a lightweight aluminum panel on a bell, um, uh, bell tower, a uh, bell um, cell phone building where there's fans um, inside that are for heat extractors. So it, it, it's a, usually has a vent screen screen on it. And during the winter, um, those those fans turn on every half an hour. So th that stone goes from freezing to hot every 30 minutes in the winter time and, and no issues with breaking it at all. And they originally had to replace um, granite material with this um, from, uh, from India that with Indian limestone because they You won't see this happen with Indiana limestone. Um, one of the interesting things uh, about this here that we're seeing is what we found on the Cast Stone Institute uh, website some time ago was that you know their acknowledgement of it. You know, phasing is due to a differential contraction between the surfaces. So basically, they're saying here that with the different materials, this phasing and cracking can, can occur, occur, and it's not um, it's something that's inherent that can happen. It's not a uh, it, rejection because it's only on the surface, but I don't know about you, but if I had a project where this happened, um, you know, th and this is considered acceptable over time with moisture, salts getting in there, that, you know, this won't happen with a man-made, with, uh, uh, with a natural stone like Indian limestone. Another failure application, uh, alkali, alkali silica reactivity often seen in sills, um, and it's all part of the process of creating man-made product. Um, with a different act, activation of different chemicals, uh, different environments um, can cause some of this cracking and crazing. And this is, you know, another thing with the man-made products is limited length. When you're looking at standard product uh, from some of these manufacturers, you're usually looking at 24 to 30 inches in length for a windowsill. Indiana limestone, we start at four feet. Four feet uh, up to eight feet long is our standard sizes. You have less mortar joints, less opportunity for water penetration later on if the actual material cracks, if the mortar cracks, um, water penetration, you get less mortar joints. It looks cleaner having one large piece of stone installs quicker as well. One large piece of stone going in there. And uh, the Indian limestone doesn't shrink at a rate that we see that the man-made products are shrinking at. So which creates a higher uh, rate of cracking in the mortar with the man-made products. So now we go into the cost effective design. Um, as we mentioned when I talked about Royal Alberta Museum, um, there's a misconception that man-made product is, is always going to be cheaper than natural stone. That's not always the case. We have different applications, different colors for almost every price point. Uh, we compete a lot of the times directly head-to-head -head with man-made products. Um, so we, we do a lot of this by using standardized material, uh, standardized sizes, 
and really focusing as a company um, on standardized product and any custom things with our fabrication network. So here's a quick video of our new investment. Um, this is an Italian CMAC uh, finishing line. We saw a little bit before, we we're able to do new finishes on here. This is the first of its kind that's been done. Primarily this kind of machinery would be used for tiles, small tiles. No one's really done the, uh, a machine like this for the large size three and five eighths thickness material that we're using. So our pavers, our panels go off this line, our sills go off of this line, our uh, smooth cap. So this utilizes a lot of great technology, gauges the material and finishes it, um, tighter tolerances, um, and really um, just a, a great, great, great thing that we've added. Um, we've added another one of these to our marble plants um, in Georgia for that hardscape launch there. And we're probably close to really having to get another one because the demand and, uh, has been so strength, strong for our standardized products. Just a quick video of our, our new new machine or a new toy that we have there. So standard products is, um, as I mentioned, you know, one of the ways we keep that cost down. Uh, still stock material, rock faced, smooth faced. Uh, in Canada, always recommended drip. Uh, for some reason, our friends in the states uh, don't like to put a, a drip rail in their sills, but always recommended a drip um, in Canada. Uh, it's better for the building, keeps moisture away from that building. Um, these are all standardized products. Uh, Mercury carries a lot of these products, uh, especially the sills and goes through a lot of them. Um, we do a lot of our panels. Um, we have pier cap shown here, hearth slabs um, that are very wide as well. Um, so standardized products is one of the ways we keep that cost down, uh, but instead of having to go everything as a custom product. So the sustainability of Indiana limestone. Uh, natural stone, one of the most sustainable uh, building uh, uh, products available. Um, durability, um, we've got historical evidence from Indiana limestone from the eight, early 1800s of projects. Um, some of these notable ones like the Chicago City Hall in the 1870s, the Biltmore Estates in 1890s, all these, or um, Chateau Laurier, uh, Hotel McDonald, Royal York, all these projects over 100 years old um, and still looking great and doing performing uh, excellently. So uh, they are recyclable. So if you, um, if you have a project that's being torn down, Ideally, you'd be able to reuse that material. If you may have to refinish it, depending on what your application is, uh, you could recut it uh, to smaller sizes. They can, be re they can be recycled to get you lead credits for that as well. Uh, very low life cycle cost, um, environmentally friendly coring process and, and actually cutting process. So all these things add to that. So uh, here's some of the lead credits. So optimized energy performance. Um, natural stone has a good insulator. Uh, Solar reflectivity for the roof, uh, heat island effect on roof. So very high solar reflectivity with Indiana limestone. Uh, so it can be used on the rooftop of buildings to reflect that heat. Um, also when it's used on hardscape applications, um, cool to the touch um, in the summer months. Um, and a lot of different applications. We have certified three of our quarries, Adams, Empire, and Victor Quarry with the Natural Stone Council. So they are certified quarries, silver level. We are looking at um, right now, uh, certifying our plants. So the actual, the actual finished product material will hopefully soon be certified as well. At this point, the quarries are certified. Um, so that's something that we're really going after uh, as well as the 2030 challenge um, with you know environmental capacity, environmental capacity. All of our quarries, um, when they are um, 
basically we extract the material out of them. They, a lot of times they use as lakes. Um, we do fill some of them um, with the uh, inert leftover stone. Uh, so, and then they're reclaimed. So we do every, when we do do that, we do a planting seminars uh, or planting uh, parties basically with the trees and bring them back to Mother Nature. So any and the main thing is any stone can go back to the earth where it came from. Um, nothing's added to the stone or which will can't contaminate the, the earth. So if need, need be, we can just push it back into an open pit. One of the things with Indiana Limestone, we do have an Indiana Limestone Institute. Uh, this is a third party institute. Uh, we are members of it, um, but we're a, th a third party expert institute, so we utilize them a lot. There's an uh, item called the Indiana Limestone Handbook, and that's really the, the Bible for the Indiana Limestone industry. It has technical information, cleaning in information. Um, a lot of it's dated material. You can see from these, some of these pictures, but the information hasn't changed as far as how to clean. Um, the performance characteristics have been around and haven't changed between natural stone. Uh, but they are a great uh, third party. If there's ever issues, I bring them in. Um, and so you can speak to the, uh, someone that's not just the, the, the provider of the stone, but a third party with case studies, um, sh shows examples, um, pretty much anything that's been happened before they've already seen, so we know how to address it. Uh, with the Royal Alberta Museum, we showed that picture early on, and that was a gray stone. And gray is, 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 is difficult when you're doing panels as there's a higher moisture content in the stone because it's usually saturated with water uh, when we quarry it. Um, so as that organic matter come out, that comes out of the stone, that color can change. So gray can change quicker um, than other stones, especially that, that project, the stone was delivered over a two year period and it was kind of installed at different times, some in the summer, some in the winter. So the stone needed a season on site. So it looked like a checkerboard in the beginning. And so we brought the third uh, Indian Limestone Institute in and said, they said, no, not a problem. We understand what's going on. The stone is seizing since it's been installed at different time periods, using stone from different areas of the quarry. Um, there's a lot of, in different cutting times, there's a lot of different moisture that's coming out of the stone. So we took pictures from every month for four months, from the same vantage point, from the same day, and you can clearly see that stone seizing. And it was a great example of how the Institute came in and helped. Uh, the contractor wasn't sure, the architect wasn't sure, but when the Institute came in and explained it all, they listened a lot more than if it was coming just from a manufacturer. We're talking about Indian limestone. Uh, as we wrap up here, I, I do need to mention some of the other polycore items. Uh, we do have a, a specific stones in our uh, hardscape and masonry, a standardized product. Polycore primarily always done was in the countertop business or custom business. Uh, but when our, with our merger at Indian Limestone and Polycore uh, two years ago, we, we started a new hardscape division. So we'll see some of our stones uh, in, in our hardscape as standardized products, um, but there's quite a bit of other stones that are available also outside that. So interior, exterior, uh, landscape, uh, countertop, uh, everything we have an opportunity with any of our stones. Um, some of our French stones here, and we have a stone, stone quarry as well. Um, and then you see the vitrosa here, which is the recycled content. This is the only area where we actually uh, venture outside of the natural stone is our vitrosa, um, which is used for countertops and, and slabs um, as well. So reasons why I want to just wrap up of why natural stone, uh, the aesthetics, uh, the, the natural beauty that man-made manufacturers are trying to go after, but can never uh, replicate 100%. Uh, the proven performance, buildings over 100 years old, um, since Indiana Lines has started being used. Um, you look back at the, uh, throughout the world, all the natural stone buildings are still uh, still around for after thousands and hundreds of years. Expert fabricators, um, we have uh, a, a fabricator network throughout North America, including Canada, uh, with fabricators. Um, as I mentioned, um, we, we full, primarily focus on standardized products um, and the raw material, but we do have a fabrication network uh, for that custom work, and we are happy to help with that and connect you with those as needed environmentally friendly. Uh, along with timber, uh, stone is the, the, the greenest uh, building materials available. It's been, been used for thousands of years and um, it will continue to be used. So here's our last little uh, um, video. Um, if you're ever able to, once uh, travel restrictions uh, are eased and you have a, if you have a project, so we'd love to have you come down or if you're just in the Indiana area and wanted to see a quarry visit, we're always happy to have you. Um, you can get education credits for coming to a quarry video, a quarry tour as well.
Schedule your quarry tour today. So that ends our presentation, my presentation. Um, at any point, if anyone has any questions at this time, uh, happy to answer any of them. Um, you can always email me or find my contact information as well through the, the um, booth information, uh, lots of downloads available there, brochures, technical information from videos. Um, make sure you take a look at our website um, and uh, happy to discuss any projects with you and how I can help. So thank you. And any questions, I open it up at this point. <laughs>